Hi, welcome everyone to the last session of the conference. A la última sesión de la conferencia sobre voces locales de mujeres por la paz. Estamos muy agradecidos interactive, informative, and participatory session. Um, our session will look at a review of, UN, of the UN Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security in the LAC region, sharing lessons, challenges, opportunities, and civil society leadership over the past 20 years. So the e-panel today will review some of the key implications that the landmark UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security 2000 in Latin America and the Caribbean. This landmark resolution reaffirms the important role of women in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace negotiations, peace building, peacekeeping, humanitarian response, and in post-conflict. A multicultural approach will be taken with practitioners from the ground who will speak on the diverse context in which they have supported women's work, women's recognition, sorry, protection, leadership, and implication in the prevention and resolution of conflicts, violence, and insecurity across broad, broad definitions. Speakers come from Haiti, Ecuador and will be speaking on context related to Bolivia, Venezuela, and the region in general. Ultimately, our intended outcomes are looking at national context, where are the shared issues, where are things different, increased understanding of the general context, and discussion of opportunities for regional participation. Like any online um, webinar, event, conference, we do have some guidelines for participation and, you know, I will share those with you at this point in time. This session will be recorded and accessible during the conference on the conference webpage and then on the Cody Institute YouTube channel. If you do not wish to have your image in the recording, please turn off your camera by clicking the video camera icon in the bottom left hand of your screen. The video is off when there is a diagonal line below the video camera. By staying in this session, you are agreeing to be recorded and having your image and any comments you speak accessible to the public. All chats, including private chats, are recorded. We kindly ask that you mute your microphones to ensure that the speakers are able to present um, to us today. If your mic is on and you are not speaking, the tech support will turn it off. Um, for chat areas, to access the chat, click on the two square speech bubbles along the bottom of the screen. Invite. Um, on the bottom of your screen where you can chat with us and also with the other moderators. Um, we encourage you to share your comments, share your questions with us so that the panelists will be able to um, respond to the screenshots will be taken and posted on Cody's social media platforms. So I think now I will just introduce our panel members um, we have with us today the beautiful and intelligent Sandrine Kenol, Executive Director of the YMCA, YWCA, sorry, my bad. Um, Leticia is a psychologist and has worked with organizations fighting for women's rights in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, promoting sexual and reproductive rights and providing psychosocial support to women and children victims of domestic violence, as well as conducting research into uh, social norms perpetuating these situations as well as femicides. Leticia is here representing the YWCA in Haiti, uh, working as a program coordinator and managing various mentorship programs and personal development workshops for women and girls in the promotion of leadership and empowerment. And so I will just do that quickly in Spanish and then Max, maybe you can do that in Creole. 
Ok. Eh, Leticia Sharp es una psicóloga que hace muchos años ha trabajado luchando por los derechos de las mujeres y las chicas en la República Dominicana y en Haití. Eh, en el trabajo de promocionar, hacer la promoción de los derechos eh, reproductivos y sexuales y eh, eh, ofreciendo apoyo psicosocial a mujeres y eh, eh, infantes víctimas de la violencia doméstica. Eh, tal vez también eh, haciendo investigaciones en cómo cambian las normas sociales y en feminicidios en la República Dominicana y en Haití. Ahora mismo está representando el YWCA como una coordinadora de programas, eh, lidiando varios programas de mentorship, perdón, y de desarrollo personal para mujeres y para chicas, en el desarrollo de su liderazgo personal y al nivel organizacional, y eh, en el empowerment de mujeres y chicas. Max, I'll pass to you. Yes, Lucia, I'm sorry, but I can't remember everything you said. Maybe you could, you could do the, you could, you could summarize it in French and English again, and then the Haitian translation is back on my so I'll be able to do it. Um, How about I ask Leticia to do her presentation in Creole? Actually, yes. <laughs> Et bonjour tout le monde. Alors Jean et Lucia et Abdillan, moi c'est un psychologue qui travaille principalement thème qui est pour avec famille avec sexualité. Moi travaille dans la première expérience de travail que moi t'ai gagné, c'est en République dominicaine côté que moi t'ai travaillé avec des jeunes femmes et avec famille qui étaient victimes de violence la caillou. Dans le cadre d'activité, nous avons fait accompagnement et jeunes femmes avec femmes. Et nous avons fait des sensibilisations dans les affaires. Et nous avons fait des activités dans le framework de la sexual et de la production de la santé, ce que je fais encore. And I teach in school on sexual education. I'm here today to talk about the YWCA Haiti, so that we can see young women of age 5 to 18 and young women of age 5 to 18. For help them to find their parents. Danielle Decoré, she's a journalist. 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 Y estoy, yo he estado trabajando en la República Dominicana en el tema de la salud sexual reproductiva de mujeres y niñas y jóvenes. Y también he trabajado con grupos de jóvenes pa, por medio de YMCA para grupos de jóvenes para ayudarle con habilidades y destrezas de la vida. And, and they um, uh, Maureen is an emerging leader focused on uh, young women's leadership and empowerment, women's Thank rights. She is here representing the Haiti Adolescent and Girls and Network um, as a project officer. So should I do that in Spanish quickly or do we have Spanish interpretation back, Eileen? I believe we have a Spanish talk. Are people able to hear the Spanish translation of this? Um, Lucia, I think Max needs to mute um, his lines one because you're hearing the feedback when he's doing the interpretation. Okay, and I will pass over then to Sherna, who will introduce the other two panelists. And we're going to be going through the agenda a little bit quicker, given that we are quite delayed on time. Yeah. So, yeah, Sherna, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Lucia. So we have with us um, on our panel, um, Gisela Davila from the International Center for Higher Communication Studies for Latin America, CIESPAL. Who, sh who will share the experience of the institution in their framework of resolution 1325 in the region, and specifically in the context of migrant women in Ecuador. Um, next on our list, um, on our panel, is Paula Vasquez from the International Organization for Migration of Ecuador, and she will share the actions carried out by the institution with migrant women and the gender perspective. 
So um, that's the list of our panel members for today. And we head right into our conversation with Latia and Maureen. Yes, I, I sorry, I'm, I'm lost in the languages. Nous allons commencer avec Maureen, qui va présenter une vision beaucoup plus who will be presenting a global vision of the Haitian context and the framework of uh, violence against women and um, Girls. And afterwards, I will present the intervention of YWCA to face these challenges faced by women and girls. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Maureen Petitfrère. I am project officer at IT Edolition Girls Network. I work with women that are evil, that are working in um, remote communities. And it's a pleasure for me to do an intervention and the and the framework of this uh, conference. Can everyone hear me? In Haiti, the violence the violence phenomenon is not new. It's been there for long. And although there's been a lot of effort made by uh, government and other actors, but it still remains um, a big challenge for women and girls to uh, have their right respected. The situation of violence in Haiti is very uh, fierce because 29% of the women that are aged from 15 to 49 are facing physical uh, violence. 12% women um, in Haiti are facing sexual violence based on the last um, 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 survey that is made by the National Ministry of Health. And women that are aged from 15 to 30 are facing um, domestic violence where they will be bitten at the head and in other kind of violence. So these figures show that the violence in Haiti is a key challenge. So in the framework of this uh, resolution, it's really uh, an, uh, an opportunity for us to sit and reflect on this situation. Because in this, and today, Haiti is now facing a very key, a very, uh, another kind of violence where gang fight is affecting women and girls and uh, in some rural and some communities. And the true massacre that has, uh, that has, that, that was perpetrated in Haiti, Massacre La Saline and, Ma and Massacre Pont Rouge, um, they've been um, perpetrated uh, recently. This resolution is very key for women to advance in their rights and, the, and peace building, but, but the situation remains a key challenging, challenge for, for them here in Haiti because the state and the government hasn't put enough uh, standards and rules to fight and, and, and resolve the situation. And the civil society, we, we work uh, with the, the, the girls and women to give them tools and, and opportunities to fight uh, violence and work for peace and to work for against violence they are they're facing in their communities this organization has been um, um, established in 2010 after the earthquake that Haiti that killed um, a lot of people in Haiti and 
their work emphasizes on women and girls and it's working in the southern department, southeast, and the west department and the most vulnerable um, communities or um, neighborhood where there's a lot of gang fighting. So the, the Egan approach really give a space for women and these communities to, to, so they can feel safe and allow us to uh, participate in what we call 3P, the first one being participation, prevention, and protection. So we work with girls and we use a, ver a very community approach where we use the community-based organization that are living in this uh, community to support these, these girls. And we, we also use mentorship that are, we use mentors that are more advanced women that are aged between 15 and 19. And we reinforce their capacity by giving them training on leadership and giving them other tools such as uh, sexual reproduction for girls and, and, and women to accompany those that are, that are lower in age to support them and to enforce to get to have more information about what's happening um, on the ground on the, on the communities where when there's um, urgent situation so we work with this grassroots organization uh, and we do work with these mentors, these women that we call mentors, and to, so they can send, give support to this uh, child and we, we create space for them uh, so they can feel safe. So we, we call it safety space. Egan's really believes that women can participate, can participate in women and peace building without tools, necessary tools. And one of the other challenges they have is poverty. So that's why we work to reinforce their leadership but as well to reinforce their economic capacity so they can become autonomous so they can take the, the good decisions for themselves and not always depend on someone else, mainly a man. And they will have a broader um, understanding of how they can participate in their community development. So the, the work we do in the framework of uh, this is the work we do in the framework of economic development and these professional activities that that are made on three to four months are here to um, help women feel more secured. So these kind of organization in the civil society, like again, on bataille pour bien-être, on bataille pour pour la vie. Et bon l'autre marche qui était faite 25 novembre dans l'occasion anniversaire um, mondial international. Côté que mesdames mieux le tap um, limité, le tap le tap milité, le tap milité pour des amendements parce que les que gain affrontement bandit dans un tas vraiment c'est c'est fio vraiment qui puisse impacter par violence là. So this 
Merci, Maureen. Alors, dans le cadre d'activité Why Up Mene, nous-mêmes nous placer, nous situer dans la commune Pétionville. Et dans la commune, ça, nous sommes nous là depuis après tremblement de terre, justement, côté Vini, après tremblement de terre, nous avons une nécessité pour les filles, pour les gens qui ont espace. Et Maureen, dans la présentation, nous avons parlé de l'espace. Nous-mêmes, nous avons un modèle ça, qui et on nécessité lié dans la commune côté de travail là, parce que principal besoin um, ma, ma, on... I believe sorry to interrupt you Leticia I believe that we have lost the English translation stream is anybody hearing the English or the Spanish yes indeed we have lost the English translation um, stream I just sent you a message concerning that Max are you there I, I, I'm listening to the Creole I'm here oui, donc le travail que vous avez mené dans la commune de Pétionville, nous avons intervenu dans différents domaines qui sont santé, éducation avec leadership. Oui, nous travaillons avec Why, le travail que Why est doing dans la communauté. Nous travaillons dans le domaine de la santé, éducation dans la communauté. Nous avons deux programmes, deux principaux, principaux programmes que nous avons visés. Premièrement, Timoun qui a l'âge entre 5 à 18 ans. We Et work puis, first jeune with femme, 18 uh, à 25 ans. Ok, we have two programs. Kids from 5 to 18 years old and another program from, I forgot what age? 18, 18 à 25 ans. 18 to 35 years of age. Programme sans jeunes, qui est le programme qui concerne les petits filles. The program for the young ones concerning the young girls. The program qui gagne la donne espacieux là. Qui gagne qui ça? I lost her. Espacieux. Qui gagne espacieux? It's like the safe space. Uh huh. C'est pour notre notre quatre programmes espacieux là. In in their program, four programs with safe space for them. By Timounio, capacité et formation en compétences de vie, formation life skill qui permettent de faire face à difficultés que vous rencontrez dans la communauté. We give them information for life skills for their lives so that for different problems, difficulties that they have in the community. Une des premières interventions que nous faisons avec eux, c'est par rapport à l'estime que vous gagnez pour être. One of the first things we work with is their self-esteem. Nous venons réaliser que une des principales défis que nous rencontrons, c'est une famille ou même. We realize that the first uh, problem they have comes stems from their family. Nous réaliser que en pile la violence que a subi yo, c'est dans c'est dans famille que les commencé et puis dans la communauté. And we realize the the violence. Reconnaissons que Muchos están experimentando violencia dentro de su hogar, pero también dentro de su comunidad. I couldn't hear the speaker, I'm sorry. En pile na, na Donc, dans le cas d'activité que nous avons mené, nous avons réalisé qu'un pile dans la situation de violence vient de vulnérabilité, de incapacité en pile de famille gagner pour faire face à besoins et petits filles, par exemple. En pile là-dedans, il pas qu'à l'école, en pile là-dedans, il obligé de en pile responsabilité, bonheur, bonheur dans la famille. Um, just verifying if the translation is still yes Leticia, i'm doing the translation right now so you can okay. you can move forward okay so in the framework of the activities we're doing intervention the framework of the activities we're doing intervention uh towards women are very important um in addition to the training we're doing for them The capacity building we are doing for them, um, psychological support, 
So we give them support to manage violence against women. So the space, the safe space is a place where they feel less exposed to other kind of violence they might be facing in their community or in the in their in their family. So the safe space is a place where they would meet every day and where they could discuss about issues they are facing in their family and receive tools and support to face these kind of uh, uh, violence. We also talk about self-esteem, um, about leadership, and we also talk about their capacity to take decisions um, as regard to um, sexual uh, um, issues. And we also work on women, human rights and uh, handicaps um, um, people with disabilities right. We also tackle the fact that even members of their family are all living with disabilities. They need to um, um, collaborate with them. We, 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 we work on inclusion and how they can in, um, integrate all the people with disabilities around them. So we do have a leadership uh, program where we teach 200 uh, women per year over two to three months. And during that time, they learn the capacity they have to, and they learn entrepreneurship and they have the possibility to have all the opportunities uh, on trainings And this new capacity, this new knowledge, help them to take better decisions and we go through their family and their lives. In addition to these programs, the intervention we do in the health is uh, referencing women to other um, institutions. Our organization doesn't have enough capacity to give all kind of support in terms of to women that are facing violence but we do have some partners where, to whom we refer our these women um, to have appropriate care when they are when they are victim of violence sometime um, some partners would come and do mobile clinic to facilitate access of these women to some health services. We're talking with Maureen about the situation um, that, that exists in the, in, the, in the communities where there's gang violence. But for example, in Cicitoulet and Mautissa, we do not go there, but we do I allow them, we give a space for them to participate in this program as well. So thanks to these leadership uh, activities, we come to realize the importance of these kind of tools that we're giving to them to face the challenges they're facing in their community. After graduating to our program, our YWC program, they become mentor and trainers one of this one of the tagline we have is change starts with me and the goal is to change to to train women and girls to become agent of change so all the training we do we we make sure that they have the capacity to go back and we transmit the training that we we originally offered pour aller une opportunité me croire dans échange aller plus en détail the times over but i hope we will have the opportunity to go over um challenges we're facing thank uh, you we're facing and the practices we use to face these um challenges 
Thank you very much, Latia and Maureen. Wonderful presentation. And we move right along. We'd like to introduce um, Gisela de Villa to do her presentation that speaks to higher communication um, and migrant women and so forth in Ecuador. Gisela. It's Paula from, uh, from OEM. Muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes. Actually, actually, it's Paula from the International Organization of Migration. Good afternoon. It's a pr pleasure to share this space with you. I'll try to speak quickly so that you have a chance to share your vision. You can tell me if this is the right approach. I'm going to divide my presentation in three parts. I'll be I'll be as quick as possible so we have time we get to catch up with time that have been lost earlier. I want to share with you particularly in the first part that's related to documents and strategies in which we are going to present all of our work. In the second part, I will tell you about an experience that we worked on some years ago with community radio networks. And the third will be the proposal and experience we have from CSPAL, which is the International Center for Higher Studies and Journalism for Latin America and the Caribbean, in how we create spaces, particularly academic spaces, for those who are in this program building the policies and in terms of gender. And so before beginning, I want to say it's a pleasure to be with you today in uh, the International Peace Day. They, it is particularly important to stress the role of women and all that has been done and continues to be done in our spaces. The first part I said, what I would like to mention has to do with the work that we carry out with a number of organizations in different places. For example, in the, in the work with Selam, which is a document that was specifically prepared for Latin America, in which we generate a study of how there are conflicts throughout the world and how they intensify and how they experienced in Latin America. And this document also addresses how these conflicts are mitigate, excuse me, are worsened in the in the context of certain spaces. Another document that we prepared has to do with the National Network of Women, which is a coalition that in the context of 1325 and in terms of the participation of women in Colombia. And unfortunately, some people say that only 30% participation level in Colombia and that that we have to find new ways to strengthen this participation and to change this reality. In terms of regional conflicts, you know, there are a number of types of conflicts, but particularly those that are related to with armed conflicts, such as that experienced in Colombia, which is very pronounced there, and other types of conflicts that have to do with irregular forces, armed forces, uh, that have to do with sometimes with uh, that are in disputing territorial rights and these territorial disputes are are reflected in violence against women who are caught in the midst of the conflict and sometimes they are sort of used as war trophies or booty and so this is the context in which this work is carried out because of the and it affects migration due to the conflicts, be it on the border areas or the peri-urban or suburban area or in the areas that are coming where around urban cities where there's not real protection from the state. And to see if we do see understand as a type of protection that's related to social processes and the integration participation of citizens, but sometimes it's considered to be so-called production protection that's armed and with that armed so-called protection leads to much graver conflicts and it is for now for example we've worked a great deal on the colombian border with ecuador and due to the venezuelan migration i think this is extremely important to address and organize it and to keep in mind and take it to context because we don't have a 
time for the real presentation through the ch common chat, I'll send you the presentation so you can see the documents to which I'm referring, and then you can see those at, with, at your ease. I'll just leave these links so that you can see them at another time. The second part of my presentation is related to the experience that we've had and that I was able to coordinate for some years in when I worked in the, an Ecuadorian uh, coordinator of community radio, uh, radio stations. It in turn part, parts of a network of community radio stations throughout Latin America and we worked on border issues it, it, it called borders or frontera rather we're working for peace and nonviolence, and we do training and work in particularly of those of us working in communication the field of communications and and from a journalism perspective and from the spaces in which we can carry out dissemination uh, so that excuse me I just been informed that I should speak a little more s slowly. I'll try to be slower, although actually the interpreter is fine if that's the issue, she's doing fine. In the experience I was trying to share with you is related to the, the a network of journalists and reporters, and particularly women, female reporters who work in the conflicts along the border areas, particularly between Ecuador and Colombia. In this space, what is done is we train, we offer training, we offer group work and to conduct an, a news analysis, for example, because we should not forget the communication media and the language is spoken is a language that's often violent language. It's an exclusive, exclu exclusionary language and it can even incite further vis uh, violence and, and we, have this option to be able to have news from different places and different concepts from around the world, but to always trying to have a space that's strengthened in terms of human rights and the protection of women, girls, and adolescents, and as being particularly vulnerable in the conflicts and it's the same as their informational spaces and also um, different weekly broadcasts to talk about the issues of greatest importance. And this is based on experience that's been very important to follow because in our region, we have to work more from uh, the people or the community-based communication, what we call popular education for these processes and much more than the traditional media. We, and so we try to offer the, the training so the language will be in, inclusive language and a peaceful language and not ex further entrench sexism and violism. And so where you can see the work we're doing in the um, links I've left for you for, and with the, where we can work even more intensely on these issues. I also wanted to mention that we are working in from CSPAL, the center that I mentioned on a, a magazine called Chasti, which is, it, it's been, this magazine has been in existence for 50 years. It's a magazine that is related to academic spaces particularly. We're also building studies and discord for peace and nonviolence and for gender inclusion and in space in academic spaces that, that have to do with the preparation of academic papers or research be, being conducted, as well as discussions and debates on gender and violence in both in each of the countries of the Americas. In this magazine, usually we refer to spaces for articulation, linkage, and debate, discussion, as, and particularly uh, the, the conditions of inequality on the border zones and how women 
are not treated equitably or equally in by the men in these spaces. So in this magazine, we try to always reflect gender equity and have a, a broad recognition of the research conducted to by and for women. And also in the last part, I wanted to share with you a link for those of you who would like to have access to this magazine, which is available in Spanish, it's called, in the latest issue, which is linked here, has to do with peace in our region. So this is a space I would, in which I would like to invite you all to participate as well, to write to this magazine and to share your, those of you who are conducting research to share that there, those of you who are involved with the, with academic circles or spaces to share there as well, please. I also wanted to mention that this is a magazine that will have 10 articles based on specific experiences of conflict and particularly in this case, this issue in Colombia, this magazine is coordinated with the National Commission for Truth of Colombia. And that's where we have many of the experiences of the armed conflict in Colombia and also responses and proposals that could be of interest. And in that again, we invite you to to share your work in this space and publish it as well. We're also working on peace building and to strengthen the culture of peace. We're interested in, in doing this to be a citation. Eh, tenemos también eh, una recopilación de um, espacios donde las víctimas pueden hablar sobre lo que han vivido en este en este conflicto y desde colectivos de mujeres tanto refugiadas y exiliadas, con experiencias desde Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, México, y sobre todo, como les decía antes, Colombia. Entonces, eh, les invito a participar en estos espacios que, eh, como decía, tienen que esta fuerza, ¿no? esta característica, para que seamos las mujeres también las que nos eh, apropiemos de estos espacios. Who were able to take over our academic spaces and organize our work and processes. And now finally, in the last minute or fraction of a minute that I have, I would like to comment that we're about to publish a book and we would like to invite you to the network it has been formed so that we can together publish a book on the culture of peace. We have a course from the UNESCO that we are offering in the culture of peace and with sharing experiences it, everything that you have experienced and have been telling it will be very good to include. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and a truly inspiring presentation. Um, and we would speak to some summaries after. I would now like to call on Paula Vasquez to do her presentation as it speaks to migrant women and the gender perspective in Ecuador. She's from the International Organization for Migration of Ecuador. Paula, 10 minutes for your presentation. Hola, buenas Sorry, tardes. Just, one, just one second, I apologize for interrupting. I just want to make sure mm -hmm. we have our Creole translation, our interpretation. Um, can, we, um, can we test that? Yes, um, I am here, except that I've been hearing the English and the Spanish at the same time, and it was so hard for me to hear okay. the English translation. Okay. Um, but I, okay. but I, was, I was here trying to do my best, but I think I, I've been able okay. to hear Okay, well, thank you so much, Max. 15%. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I can start? Yes, Paula, go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Paula Vasquez and from the International Organization of Migration, it's the UN Agency for Migration and we've been working since 1967 developing a number of projects and promising in support of the Ecuadorian government to address the challenges there. I know I tend to speak very quickly, I will try to force myself to speak more slowly. 
today I would like to share with you a little bit of the work that's carried out by the IOM in Ecuador and with the with, with gender perspective in Ecuador from the perspective of migrant women and girls since 1917 for numbers of that hundreds of thousands of migrants have left uh, Venezuela and many of them have gone to Ecuador, a country that's already facing uh, an economic crisis which has been worsened by the pandemic. And currently uh, now uh, 165,000 Venezuelans have settled in uh, Ecuador and a number I didn't catch of those are women. And this, at, the, and at the beginning there were 59% were men and then women were men were initially forced to leave looking for jobs and subsequent migration waves have been formed by women girls children and full families and and yes in addition this migration has made uh, forced many women to take uh, become the heads of fam households in venezuela and this process means that the means that the assume responsibilities to be able to provide for all the members family members who are still in Venezuela and the, so assuming so many different roles in a violent context is so challenging for all of them and the framework of Venezuelan fr migration we've seen situations of violence based gender-based violence against women adolescents and girls and this the international cooperation agencies and civil society organizations including IOM have worked to the prevention of gender-based violence as well as the protection of violences in work in linkage with the state in the framework of the state's responsibilities. I want to tell you a little bit of the profile of Venezuelan women who are migrating. The IOM has a tool which is called BTM which is the profile of Venezuelan population. This tool is a survey that's been conducted in seven cities in the country well, among about 20,000 migrants and it gives it's, it's a, gives you an idea of the profile of Venezuelan women 48 percent of the women over eight, the age of 18 who responded to the survey had to finish their high school and 22 percent have some type of higher education 16 percent have finished the concluded the university studies so the Venezuelan women are women who at least have their were able to have their high school degree and some college studies. And if we said this group, the group said, yes, they had, what, 42% had serious difficulties during the trip in some one of the lack of economic resources and lack of security. Now the women who are in Ecuador, in Ecuador, 52% are working at freelance or independently, which means they might be selling things at the traffic lights or this. Forty-eight percent of the women who responded to the survey have been have suffered discrimination. Of this, the main cause has had to do with their nationality. Ninety-eight percent of the women who suffered discrimination said it was due to their nationality. So, so how does the IOM? participate throughout this migration process from the time they come to the, cross the border from to Colombia, Ecuador, there's been migrant organizations trying to cover basic needs. And so they're women's residents and, and they receive kids with some base to meet some basic needs, sometimes are protection kits for women, which are that include also have information on gender-based violence, the trafficking of persons and the trafficking of migrants. We also provide psychosocial support through a telephone line. And this has increased in four by 400% to, since the pandemic beginning. And we also offer guidance, guidance to institutions for those facing violence and or those who are uh, threatened by trafficking of persons. The IOM is also providing temporary housing and rent through renting and internal transportation. It's uh, to or 
uh, to make sure a family can reach where they might have some contacts and will have a support network where they arrive. The IOM this year, also one of the main purposes in which it was, it was this whole situation was twitched with the pandemic, had to do with social cultural migration. One of our most important projects is livelihoods. And this project was carried out in two stages. At the second end of last year and at the beginning of this year. About 200 persons were benefited. Of those 200 persons, more than 60% are women with both soft skills and technical skills for entrepreneurship to the, be able to have a way of supporting themselves in the country. Many of the women have been able to put into practice their knowledge and to work in, in collaboration with their communities in the 70% of the project uh, participants are Venezuelan and 30% are Ecuadorian community members and the idea is to have a mixed population participation and have they receive seed money to start their businesses. I wanted to share a, vi a video, but I know this the logistics are a little bit complicated, so we may not do it right now. But because of the pandemic, our support has turned into direct is assistance and more emergency response. And I wanted to share that the IOM works directly with migrants. We also work with the state. Let me give you an example. In, in 2018, we supported the state that was passing a law to prevent violence against women. That was a significant advance in terms of combating gender-based violence in, in, in a preventative framework. Unfortunately, in this gender-based violence law, they did not take into account the LGBTI population. So we continue working in that sense. I'll try to jump ahead to just mention the highlights. In 2019, we approved a, an action plan against the tra trafficking of persons. And it, it's recognized as one of the structural reasons for the incidence of gender inequalities in inequities as one of the re one of the main basis for the trafficking of women and so the trafficking of women in persons is something that we've been working for with civil society and the state and we seek actions in which we can um, now continue we do have an important need to have an integrated approach to change this all the projects that the io has have a gender focus. Dedication of kids to the creations of different aspects of the project. So, as I was saying, there's a large need to to deal with gender-based violence from an integral, a holistic look, especially face, especially in dealing with restudying masculinity and we deal with young people about masculinity and that focus on that and how that affects gender and organizations like OIM and UNPA and UN Women have brought their efforts together to try to d help um, front first responders deal with gender violence and we also work with many um, trying to raise consciousness about um, with journalists, for example, as well as with the state. So, for example, when they come to the border, that another woman should be checking them. There should be a psychosocial assistance by a woman. And we also follow up with young women. There's lots of girls who are traveling on their own. Maybe they're not coming to Ecuador, but they're going to Peru. And so we accompany them. And so we're really um, trying to figure out how women arrive and how we, um, if, they're, if they're coming here in Ecuador, how they stay here. And in the end, I'd like to post a link within the UN system. Last year, we started a campaign against xenophobia, xenophobia which is called arms that bring us together and so it's part of a campaign to listen to UNHCR so we try to create telling stories through 
networks. And so we try to tell stories about different women from different places and Venezuelan women, Venezuelan women too. So we try to share that. We're doing this on Facebook and Instagram and you can follow us there and participate and, and see and listen to the stories. Thank you very much. There's my husband coming in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paula. Um, we would like to open the floor and to do that, I'll just do a brief summary of the presentations. Take about a minute and a half to do that. Um, Maureen um, spoke about the community approach to support women and girls in um, Haiti using that grassroots um, organization, using grassroots organizations. Um, and women as mentors to create safe spaces. Um, she spoke about the challenges which looks at um, poverty um, and that the work that they do in that area is to build leadership capacity with the women and girls that they work with, um, enhance decision-making um, capabilities and also economic development, focusing also on women and girls' self-esteem. So that, that um, work that is being done to create safe spaces for women empowers them holistically. Um, the health education aspect um, in the community was also sp um, spoken about and looking at young two programs, looking at five to 18 years and the 18 to 35, focusing again on um, health, health um, self-esteem and looking at realizing that the first problem when it looks at violence against women comes from the family and also from the community. The um, Latia, you know, spoke about those two programs and also women unable to go to school due to early responsibilities. Once again, um, honing into that aspect of self-esteem, safe space, capacity building, um, seeing some relation there to what Maureen spoke about. And, but also looking at people with disabilities and their rights for inclusion and working with them. They also have this referral system based on their capacity to refer some of their clients to um, other organizations. But looking again at leadership, so I'm seeing these trends coming in, the self-esteem, entrepreneurship, leadership, decision-making to empower women to regain their autonomy and agency um, from IOM, three areas that document any strategies, um, looking at conflicts, um, how these conflicts worsen over time based on the geographical location, the participation of women in Colombia as peace builders, and looking at new ways to address conflicts, um, but also speaking to no adequate protection and support from the state um, in relation to the prevention of gender-based violence. She spoke about the magazine, which is basically academic based, looking at research, looking at debates around conflicts and, you know, getting certain articles looking at peace building within the context and also the communication aspect, building the capacity of women between Ecuador and Colombia to um, speak to the news that is happening in their region and also the ways that they're working for peace. So exclusively including a non-violent um, language and also an inclusive language focusing on gender equity and equality. And Paula, you know, the work that IOM Ecuador is doing in connection with migrants and, you know, spoke to some figures here of 165,000 Venezuelans um, migrated to um, Ecuador and this places women in Venezuela to be the head of households because of the migration of men um, seeking a better life due to the various um, factors and she spoke about the BTM, BTM tool which is a survey um, actually profiling of Venezuelan women population and it shows that 42% lack economic security, 52% um, work freelance, be it selling items on the streets, 48% are discriminated against based on their nationality and 
she spoke about the programs that they offer, the Women's Residence Program, which provide protection kits, um, info on gender-based violence and trafficking, the psychology support through the telephone line, guidance to institutions. So we have a wide variety of information given to us today. The floor is open for questions. Feel free to send your questions to us towards the panel members. Also bearing in mind the climate of COVID. How does the COVID climate impact women and girls in Latin America and the escalation of violence and also migration? So as we wait on, on the questions coming in, once again, we are truly grateful for your participation today. We, we understand that we have had some technical difficulties. And as I said earlier, technology is not perfect, but we're here and we're pushing forward because that, that is what leaders do. We move forward despite the obstacles that we are facing to continue the work in a marvelous uh, um, way. So I will um, present a question to the panelists. When we think about the COVID um, climate, I know from the Trinidad and Tobago aspect, there has been and continues to be an increase in domestic violence. Um, to the extent that partners are hiding um, computers, hiding computer cords, you know, um, embarrassing women who are working online. Um, what has been the state of women during this COVID-19 pandemic in Haiti, in Ecuador, in Colombia? So Latia, Maureen, yes, go ahead. OK, donc à partir de, de mars, je crois que c'est le So, famille. starting in March. Et il y a une détention en Haïti. Et il y a un pile d'activités et d'organisation qui étaient obligés de camper pour et empêcher la propagation de la COVID-19. To stop the propagation of the coronavirus. So, could you do yeah. the call okay. and then just quickly resume in English? Okay. I so, could I could do it as well or Max, but you are very Okay. Good. So um starting in March in Haiti, we had the how the first cases of COVID nineteen that forces us um at the YWCA to um stop some of our, our activities, um not put at um our participant at risk. So one of the first challenges that we, we had is regarding the safe space. Um, a lot of the girls are, were counting on our activities to um, get a meal a, a day and be safe during the day when their parents are um, at work because a lot of them live in very at-risk communities and most of the girls don't feel safe at home and rely on our safe space during the day to not be exposed to 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 violence. So un pile un pile da na e jeune fille qui participe na activité nou yo. So most of the women who participate in our activities they count on the participation um they count on us to have a a, a meal per day for their family. For example, if a family has two, 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 two uh, girls, they know they will have, be able to find a meal. One of the key challenges we face is the fact that we couldn't receive these girls in our, in our space. Uh, the, these girls are a victim of violence. So we have, um, just like um, in Hagen, we have the mentors that are part also of the communities and can relate, um, relate information to, to us and about the, the safety of the girls if they need any referral to get uh, assistance um, after being exposed to, to, to any violence. 
um, they can they can reach out to us through um, different lines that we 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 put in place or, uh, emergency lines so they we we make sure that they all always have a, a mean to get in touch with um the the organization so ça nous t'est fait nous t'est nous t'est tout de suite et créer des réseaux we did we created mentorio qui fait appel des petits mounio yo fait partie de communauté hein yo t'est ca al fait porte à porte garder côté qui gentil mounio t'est si tout monde t'est en forme et si yo t'est bien besoin nous t'est toujours ca rentrer en contact avec yo pour référer yo à des services de santé services de et support support psychosocial et les yo t'est besoin our first action also was to um, give um, kits a, of uh, meal and um, sanitary kits for for all the participants. You know, action to do buy a the distribution of kits, sanitary and kit alimentaire for for participants. That way, they can uh, they they were able to to um, go along for a month or two before we could start um, working again on uh, um, with with smaller groups of, of girls et nous t'ai fait ça pendant deux mois pour permettre timounio et joindre moyen pour pour subsister pendant pendant deux mois avant que nous ca reprenne activité avec des plus petits groupes de de 10 à 20 filles par jour um, so for now, we are slowly um, getting back to our um, initial schedule, receiving the girls with um, some measures of uh, um, sanitary measures, the washing hands, um, wearing masks, um, monitoring their temperature when, when they come to, to the center. Et Kounia nous recommence l'activité avec des mesures de précaution qui c'est lavage des mains et, et port du masque avec prise de température avant que vous rentrez dans le centre. Et je ne sais pas si, si Maureen a ajouté un bagage sur l'aspect COVID-là. Et je ne sais pas si je peux parler de l'aspect covid là Maureen, I don't know if you want to share um, some of your experience with Hagen. Um, Maureen, yeah, sorry, oh. Latia and Maureen, we have, you know, just probably about a minute or two. Oh, okay. Um, Lucia, you can um, tell me if I'm wrong to look to close up. So one more question and then we look to wrap up. So, um, Paula, to, this question goes to you, and it goes again in line with the COVID-19 pandemic and looking at migrants from Venezuela and other parts from Latin America into Ecuador. Um, can you just give us a brief um, idea of how the pandemic has, uh, has affected the migrants and their relationship with um, other persons in Ecuador? Claro que sí. Bueno, primero, lo que ocurrió con el tema de pandemia es que... Course, la... The first thing, what happened with the pandemic is that the borders closed down. So people who were traveling either from on somewhere else to Chile or to Peru, they got stuck where they were. And second, we're also in the process of giving humanitarian visas, and this had a cost of $50. With the pandemic, nobody had any money. There was so much unemployment and many migrants had no more access to this visa. So we um, did several, you know, campaigns of communication to try so that they would have a safe place to stay and not continue on their trip because a lot of people were also returning. People lost their lives, wanted to go back to Venezuela because they'd lost their jobs where they were living. So this made, they were going through a 
irregular transport crossing borders without going through inspection. So what we were trying to do is provide assistance so they could fulfill their quarantine. We had no idea quarantine was going to last six months, but trying to work with other agencies to try to sustain this until at some point the the borders would open and they're not going to open until October. So we're going to see what happens. There's been a lot of work done, as I said at the beginning, to try to deal with inclusion and work, um, um, work inclusion and social, and working with shelters, working with areas that are in trying to deal with, you know, with trafficking a lot. And, um, try to make sure people have capacity to identify this situation. So the pandemic has changed us all. And um, most, unfortunately, most migrants were, had no work. They had informal work. So now we hope um, things go back to a new normal. And we hope things become somewhat normalized so that they are paid um, what they should by law. So we're trying to strengthen and deal with the issues of violence. Unfortunately, being locked into a closed area is very difficult. It's very difficult to call people for help. So we're trying to you know, create strategies to send a message to a neighbor, or if you hear about something, if you hear something's happening with your neighbors, call us so we can go through this process and, 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 and report it. So in, Early, we also were dealing with Corape to try to prevent messages to prevent violence. So, you know, I think it was a, a surprise for all of us that we've had to be dealing with this for so long and we have to like get used to, I mean, I'm saying that in quotes because we can't really get used to it, but we're, you know, we're fine, we're here, we have a roof over our heads, but outside there were people who had no money for a mask or no food. So we keep working for that every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. And once again, thank you to all our participants. What today has taught us is that each one of us have a responsibility to collectively co-create a better Latin America and the Caribbean because women and girls' lives are at stake. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated a lot of the social issues. And we're seeing now what we should, what we should look at as we move forward is why do these inequalities qualities exist? Why do discrimination against women and, and members of the LGBTQI communities exist so that we can co-create a better region that is inclusive for all peoples, looking at economic security, job security, housing security, but specifically on the health impact of women and girls within the region? Um, tying into that is the violence at the family and the community level, and also state violence that, that we sometimes leave out of the mix. So we have a lot of work to do, um, a lot of things to get done within our region. We have done a lot, but we're not there yet. And together, we can work together to co-create a better Latin America and the Caribbean. Bearing in mind that in 2017, UNDP, UN Women, from their report stated that Latin America and the Caribbean is the most violent region for women and girls outside of a conflict context. And driving the Women and Peace and Security Agenda 1325 is utmost important because too often in the region, peace is seen as um, labeled towards the war-torn zones. Um, and we need to redefine and reimagine what peace looks like in the region and what um, violence, because a lot of times the violent expression of conflict is um, misinterpreted for conflict. So thank you all very much for joining us. We do look forward for each one of you to continue participating in the future sessions of this wonderful conference that Cody and their partners have um, put together. And I hand over now to Lucia. Hi, everybody. Um... I'm just going to do this in Creole because it is a little bit moon, but we have said Creole, traduction Creole, moins Creole, and then we have a minute, we have a minute, so excuse me, 
vraiment nous avons essayé de faire fort, mais enfin, moi, j'espère que avec le mélange espagnol-anglais, peut-être que tu es capable. Et je suis capable de comprendre tout ça, nous te dit. Merci en pile pour participation, et Laetitia, Maureen, Paula et Gisela. Oh, vraiment, vraiment, je veux remercier tout le monde et nous, 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 Uh, thank you again. We have a whole yes. week of sessions at the uh, Women's Voices for Peace, Local Women's Voices for Peace Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the uh, experiment, I think, today. So we're going to get all of the kinks <laughs> out in terms of the technology. And it will be a much more fluid, fluid conference because of our session today. <laughs> so please, we look forward to seeing all of you for the rest of the week uh, at different sessions and hearing your stories and about your work.